everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Impaired Dendritic Cell Homing in COVID-19. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by VisioFarm. To learn more, visit visiofarm.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, you can report your problem by using the Ask a Question box as well. All questions will be answered by the speakers via the email address you provided at the time of registration. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Lucas Borscherding, medical student, Technical University of Munich, and Ralph Huss, MD, PhD, head of the Center of Digital Medicine and Deputy Director of Pathology, University Hospital in Augsburg, Germany. Lucas, Dr. Huss, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome to the webinar on impaired dendritic cell homing in COVID-19. I welcome you from the Institute for Pathology and Molecular Diagnostics at the University Hospital in Augsburg, Germany. My name is Ralf Huss. I'm a professor of pathology at the Institute of Pathology and Molecular Diagnostics, and at the same time, deputy director and professor at the Center and Institute of Digital Medicine, also in Augsburg. The Institute of Pathology is part of the large regional and university hospital in Augsburg, serving more than 2 million people in the region. This, of course, also implies the medical care for those patients who have been infected by COVID-19 pandemia and associated diseases. One of our main focus over the past two years of the COVID-19 pandemic was the performance of autopsies to better understand the disease and the consequences for the progression of the disease and potential treatment opportunities. In this map, you see all autopsies performed in Germany, as you can also see that Augsburg was the second largest center performing such autopsies. Only Hamburg performed more autopsies, but most of them were of forensic origin and with a different focus than what the Institute of Pathology has done here in Augsburg. During the first wave, including the variants Alpha and Beta, 19 autopsies were performed on 22 COVID-associated deaths which resulted in several publications on such autopsies. Here is just a selection of some of those publications dealing with the way autopsies should be performed in a highly contagious disease, which is associated with a very high mortality. Some studies also included the mapping of the viral load throughout the body and, of course, with particular focus on the presence of the virus and virus strains in lung and the upper airways. Today, my colleague Lukas Beucherding, after my introduction, will present his data on impaired dendritic cell homing in COVID-19 lungs. Let's try to understand why this is so important. COVID-19 predominantly affects the lung tissue of infected patients. And during this infection, it causes a diffuse alveolar damage in different 
stages. And most of the viral RNA was detectable in the upper airways and lungs, while there are also other parts of the body where viral DNA could be detected, but at a certainly lower frequency and tighter. <clears throat> As mentioned before, there are three clinical stages of diffuse alveolar damage associated with COVID-19. The first stage is the so-called exudative diffuse alveolar damage, which causes a thickening of the membranes and also a thickening of the alveolar walls, which will decrease the exchange of oxygen between the airways and the blood. During the second clinical stage of DAD, called organizing DAD, a proliferation of fibroblasts starts to continue the thickening of the alveolar walls and also stiffening more the entire architecture of the lung. The end stage DAD con uh, continues with an increasing solidification of the lung tissue with more collagenous fibrosis and very stiff lung tissue, which almost completely hampers the exchange of oxygen. Of course, the clinical surveillance and critical care of those patients increasing during the different stages of the de disease, requiring more intensive care and also extra membranous oxygenation of the blood. We also looked <clears throat> into some possible explanations of the immune response in the different stages of COVID-19 DAD and came along a publication by Nienhold et al, who described two distinct immunopathological profiles in lung autopsies of COVID-19. One population showing high interferon levels, while others seem to have lower interferon. Why is this so important? Interferon is a critical player in the maturation and activation of certain cellular immune components. It is involved in the maturation and homing of dendritic cells, along with the presentation of tumor and viral antigens, and also the activation of ho and homing of antiviral T cells, and also the selection of antibodies generated by activated B cells. Only if this entire cellular portfolio does exist at a functional level and a significant number, a viral infection can be coped with and a patient has a chance to survive the disease. Along those lines, there have been other publications explaining the role of COVID-19 and associated viruses in the immune response. It was shown that the upregulation and presentation of viral antigens could be impaired due to a lack of MHC class 1 or 2 upregulation. And SARS-CoV can also be able to infect monocytic derived dendritic cells, which interferes with the functional presentation of antigens to allow an activation of T cells. At the same time, SARS-CoV-2 also changes the expression of certain chemokines, which might alter the homing of dendritic cells to the affected organs. Simultaneously, there are data pointing towards an impaired maturation of dendritic cells. So many questions remain even after two years of COVID-19 pandemic. It is still a question on the role 
of immature dendritic cells on their maturation and their possibility to reprocess antigens, whether the recruiting and activation of immature dendritic cells is hampered due to virus infection, whether its activation, including the presence of danger signals, is still present, and other mechanisms that involve the maturation of dendritic cells and an adequate cell-mediated immune response. One of the aspects of the immune response, with particular focus on the role of dendritic cells in diffuse alveolar damage, will be presented by my colleague and student at the Institute, Lukas Beucherding. Thanks so much for the introduction, Professor Hus. All right, let's get to our brief research report, Impaired Dendritic Cell Homing in COVID-19, which was published in Frontiers in Medicine, Pathology in November 2021. My name is Lukas Borcherling. I'm in the last year of medical school in the Technical University of Munich, and I paused in 2020 for a year to do a bit of research in Augsburg. What we wanted to do was take a look at the inflammatory infiltrate in the lungs of fatal COVID-19 cases. In this particular study, we examined the lung tissue of the COVID-19 autopsies of the first wave in Augsburg. At that time, there was a huge amount of papers on COVID-19 getting published, and some of these focused on the immune dysregulation. However, we found that most of these works were about the peripheral blood count, so there were actually very few studies taking a look at what one might call the most commonly affected organ in COVID-19, which is the lung. Now, there were a few works using conventional immunohistochemistry on autopsy tissue and some using bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, but not really detailed descriptions of the local inflammatory infiltrate. As mentioned before, coronaviridae have been reported to affect dendritic cells, so we decided to investigate the population of antigen-presenting cells. In the first wave in Augsburg, 19 COVID autopsies were performed out of 22 COVID-19 deaths in the university hospital in total. We are still very grateful to the relatives of the deceased who agreed to the autopsies during these trying times. Now, some cases underwent only partial autopsies, which is why we started with 83 lung lobes. All of these cases were first stained with conventional immunohistochemistry on CD4 and CD8. There was a very scarce CD8 reaction, by the way. And the lobes that didn't show an adequate reaction to the stains were discarded. We then constructed a tissue microarray of the remaining 81 lobes, 10 cores per lobe, and proceeded with the immunofluorescent staining. Some showed processing artifacts and were also discarded. Out of originally 810 cores, 608 were stained satisfactorily in the end. These remaining lung lobes had already been analyzed for a different study and assigned a diffuse alveolar damage stage. So in the end, we had 608 cores from 71 lung lobes from 17 patients. Unfortunately, there was not a large number of M stage 3 lobes or M end stage DAD and also not a large number of non-DAD lung lobes. The stain we used was the Ultimapper Fixed View APC kit used to stain antigen presenting cells. So we had CD24B cells on the FITC channel, CD11C4 myeloid dendritic cells on Cyan5, MHC class 2 on Cyan7, and a cocktail of CD68 and CD163 to mark tissue macrophages on Texas Red. The way this works is that after staining, each fluorophore gets scanned sequentially, so the end result is one insanely large image file containing five layers. The fifth layer being DAPI to stain DNA. That means that every single cell in theory can take 16 different states. However, of course, not all of these states are biologically possible. Stay with me just a little longer and we will get to the pretty pictures in a minute. 
if you're dealing with this amount of multidimensional data, there is no way around digital image analysis. For this project, the multiplex phenotyping module by VisioPharm was the ideal method. To put it simply, the first thing the software does is scanning for the DAPI signal. This process is based on deep learning. If there's a somewhat round structure with a certain intensity of DAPI, it gets marked as a nucleus. Again, this is a simplification. Next, for every single cell, the intensity of each channel is evaluated. You can also adjust the settings, for example, if you have a rather strong background signal in one channel. Now, the module automatically generates a list of all detected cell types based on the surface antigen expression. For example, there are cells expressing CD20 only, but also cells expressing CD20 and MHC class 2 as well. Additionally, VisioPharm also lets you generate various graphs such as phenotype plots, interactive Tisney plots, etc. And while we are at it, I would also like to thank Alima Texan from VisioPharm again for her excellent support and for her endless patience. Here's an example of the user interface in VisioPharm. On the top left, you can see what it looks like if all channels are activated. As you can see, there are four cells and one of these is very brightly stained. The top right shows what it looks like when only the DAPI and CD11C channel are activated. On the bottom left, MHC class 2 and DAPI. And finally, in the bottom right is VisioPharm's interpretation of the cells. Three of these cells were assigned the class negative and marked in gray, and one was assigned the class MHC2 positive and CD11C positive and marked in bright orange. Now, at this point, it might still seem like something that could be done manually if you're very, very, very patient. But if you look at what you're actually going to work with, it becomes a bit overwhelming very quickly. And this is VisioPharm's interpretation of the image. MHC class 2 only positive cells are marked in pink. There are mostly epithelial cells in this case. We have negative cells in gray, macrophages marked in red, and, drumroll, one dendritic cell marked in orange. Right here. Now, this is a prime example of a cell that would have certainly escaped my attention. After the classification, VisioPharm can also be used to automatically count the cell populations. What we have here is the fraction of cells in a certain category divided by the total cell count. As you can see, we didn't include end-stage DAD lobes in the analysis due to the low count of only three samples. The B cell count and the macrophage count didn't show any significant differences, but there was an increased count of myeloid dendritic cells in stage 2 compared to stage 1. Interestingly, there was no significant difference in the MHC class 2 expression by MDC in the different stages. This is remarkable because in the viral mapping paper by Hirschbühl, there was an inverse correlation of viral load and DAD stage. So we took a closer look to see if there was a correlation of the MHC class 2 expression by MDC and the detection of viral RNA in the samples. And we didn't find one. As mentioned by Professor Hus before, in the process of DC maturation, there is a shift in the surface antigen expression. Now, activated DC show an upregulation of MHC molecules, as well as co-stimulatory molecules like CD80, CD86, and CD83. So these markers can be considered maturation markers. If DC failed to upregulate these markers, this might be a sign of a defective maturation process. So we attempted further stains of maturation markers, this time using conventional immunohistochemistry. The problem is that these maturation markers are not particularly specific for DC. They're also harder to analyze. Here you can see a double stain with CD83 marked by fast red and CD11C marked by DAB. As someone who more or less learned to do AI analysis before classical IHC analysis, I was kind of surprised by how ambiguous these stains can be.
The arrow is pointing to a relatively easy to distinguish double positive cell, but not all double positive cells were as good to see. Now, once again, here's the comparison to the multiplex stains where you can just switch off the display of certain channels if needed. And there's also one more problem with conventional IHC. For me, it meant having to count the cells manually. So analyzing the conventional stains means sitting in front of the microscope or the bright field scans for several days and basically click a train yourself. While this process is a very repetitive task, it is also highly subjective and error prone. In the end, the IHC stains in general confirmed our findings, but due to the varying specificity, these results should be taken with a grain of salt. If you're interested in further details, there's a link to the paper at the end of the presentation. Let's recap. We compared the population of antigen-presenting cells in different stages of diffuse alveolar damage in COVID-19 lungs. There were no significant differences in the count of B cells and macrophages, but an increased count of MDC in later DAD stages. There also was no correlation of viral load and MHC class II expression in MDC. At the same time, previous works have established an inverse correlation of DAD stages and viral load. We also stained the lungs for co-stimulatory molecules, using them as DC maturation markers, none of which showed a higher expression in early DAD stages. What could this mean? In later DAD stages, dendritic cells appear to accumulate. There is no significant upregulation of MHC class II molecules and other maturation markers in early stages. This could indicate a generally hindered MDC maturation process. As the shift in surface antigen expression is what enables MDC to leave the site of acute inflammation and home to lymph nodes, this disruption of the maturation process might ultimately lead to an inadequate activation of T lymphocytes. There are still a few open questions and some limitations to the study. The first problem is that the case number was rather small and also we couldn't investigate lungs of corona variants. I also don't feel completely comfortable making statements about non-DAD lungs. And of course, non-fatal cases would also be interesting to observe, but taking lung samples, tissue samples from ARDS patients with a known cause is hardly to justify. I also want to point out that the actual cellular mechanism is still unclear, so far it's just a theory. So, as always, further research needs to be conducted. If you want to fully understand our work, I suggest you read the original paper, as a webinar, of course, sometimes requires a few cuts regarding the content. To read the full paper, please follow the QR code using the camera of your phone, or just use the DOI link. That's it. Thank you for your attention, and feel free to send any questions to the email address below. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas and Dr. Huss, for your informative presentation, for your time today, and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Visio Farm, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions submitted today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.